press this to yeah okay hi everyone i'm ben um i'm the archaeological archives curator at the northamptonshire archaeological resource center and i'm going to talk to you today about how we've been working with community groups um, in northamptonshire with their archives getting them deposited improving the standards that sort of thing um this might work oh no this way around there you go cool right so before i kind of go into we're going to discuss a few case studies but um, I'll just give you a bit of background. So Northamptonshire has had loads of really, really good community projects taking place since the 80s. Some of them are since earlier than that, I think. Um, but it's been a county where it ran out of space for archaeological archives in the uh, 1990s, but realistically it was before then. And since then, there's been no sort of curation of the archives. And there's been sort of no professional support from a kind of curatorial standpoint. Um, it's also had a county where the relationship between professional archaeologists and some community groups has not necessarily been the best. Um, but so we ran out of space, but in 2021, we, um, we opened the North Ants Arc, and we're now the publicly accessible archaeological archive repository for the whole county. Um, before I started this job, there had been a limited scope in for um, the archaeological um, archives that community groups held, but hadn't really there wasn't anything that I could say that was like, I knew exactly how many boxes there were. Um, but so since I've started, I've been engaging with these groups and talking to them about what they've got, going to see what they've got, and um, basically working it out from there. So I'm gonna go through a few case studies of sort of different areas that we've sort of hit upon on it really. So the first one is CLASP. So CLASP are, um, what is it? Community Landscape Archaeological Survey Project, I think is what it stands for. Um, and it's the largest community group in Northamptonshire. They do a lot of work in the sort of west side of the county around um, Daventry and sort of west of Northampton. And they actually maintain their own archives. So they have over a thousand boxes of archives um, in this building here and a few shipping containers that they have on site. Um, they've dug a Roman villa, an Anglo-Saxon cemetery, uh, quite a lot of stuff. Um, but they, when they contacted me, um, in 2020, it was in 2020, they were under pressure. This is on a, a farm and the, um, the landowners had to sell very quickly or the, the fear was that they would have to sell very quickly. And they were like, what are we gonna do with all of this material? And this is actually before the Ark opened. So we couldn't, we'd have to have put it in an empty building essentially. But we had a chat about what we could do and we agreed that we could act as the store of last resort for them because they've got some really significant archives from, from really significant sites that aren't necessarily all written up, but the information is there. So we agreed that we would take the archive um, if everything went wrong. Um, but then we also started to chat to them about what's the long-term future. And we haven't yet kind of made any solid decisions on that, but they are starting to use our archive standards uh, more. So um, these boxes here, they've all now got our um, event number from the historic environment record on, which is now we use as the main link between uh, there's two databases, which does mean that we can we know what sites they belong to. And it also meant that the HER now has lots more sites on it because there's been things that have been reported. Um, and we've also said that, because they don't really, you can see this, is, this room's quite full. They don't really have the space to sort through things. So we've agreed to take 200 boxes of Fieldwalk CBM. There's a lot of Fieldwalk CBM. Um, we've had that conversation too. <laughs> But um, we've agreed to take that temporarily for six months, a year, however long that they basically need. So they've actually got the space to start doing this for the whole of their archive. So that's kind of just one way that, like we're able to provide the space because we have it. Um, this next one is Soulgrave Castle. Uh, so this is quite an unusual one. that I've, I've not come across a community group where they've done this before. So there was a historical excavation on um, Soulgrave Castle Mound in from 1960 to 1976 by uh, Queen's University Ulster, um, Brian Davison. And the archive, I think, was, um, I'm not sure where the archive was actually kept, but the community group decided to take it on as a project in 2005 and wanted to basically sort it. The site was never properly written up. There was a few sort of interim reports, but the site was never properly published. The archive was a mess. And the community group decided to put together a HLF bid with lots of other um, kind of local pots of funding and they managed to raise around £55,000 to, to get this site sorted. Um, there's a few problems along the way. Uh, the person who was writing it up, up passed away, but there's now someone else who's doing it. And the site is due to be published this year, which is really good. But they also started sorting the archive. The only thing was, is they put it in, they, they had nowhere to put it. There was no repository for this archive. 
So they put it in this. This is the very cricket pavilion where it was kept, um, which had holes in the ceiling. So when the archive, when, when we opened, they said, oh, will we take the archive? And clearly it's a really significant site. So we said yes. And then it arrived and there was lots and lots of black mold on everything. So basically, as soon as it came in, we started having to rebox it. But it was still worth taking because it's clearly a really significant site that we've now had researchers from the University of Exeter actually want to use this as a, a part of a major research project, which would never have been possible. And that potentially brings, you know, funding opportunities, all sorts of different things, which would never have been possible if we just said no, because, you know, it's, they've not got any money. It's going to be um, hassle for us. So then we've got Eyes Archaeological Society, which you dog at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was an excavation of a Roman bathhouse near Kettering. Um, and basically, it started with a few professional archaeologists, but there was issues, and it ended up um, the community group basically had to take it on themselves. And they didn't really have, they had limited support, but not lots of support. Um, and it, they sort of struggled with it. The site's still not written up. I think it was excavated. They started in the 2000s. So it's been going on a long time. But we thought, well, we can help them with the archives. It's currently um, one of our volunteers at the ARC is, um, is the person who is storing all of this. And he kind of came to us, and we had a conversation. And basically, it's all in his shed. And we thought, maybe we should get it out of the shed, because it's not maybe the best place for the material. Um, so we've been basically providing them hand-me-down uh, boxes. So we have to rebox around 60% of our entire collection. So we, we've got lots of old boxes. So we've been providing them and asking him again to, to link it to the historic environment records. So there's that link there. And it basically means that while this won't be a perfect archive when it turns up, because these are boxes we didn't want in the first place, it does mean it is actually coming in boxes and not, you know, random bags and crates and there's actually like some semblance of order we've also been providing fines bags to them as well because they just haven't had they don't have any funds for any of it um, but it does mean that we're going to get an archive that's actually something approach approaching a better archive when when it actually gets deposited and the other thing we've done is we've, we've got a, uh, several rooms on site where they can we've offered that they can work with um, and go through it on site because this is currently his office in his house and there's not really space to do it to get lots of people around the table to sort through lots of Roman pottery. So we were able to provide those facilities. Um, so, and then the final one, Eastern Wardit Villa. So again, this is a historical excavation that took place between 87 and nine, uh, 2001. And this is one where they really fell out with professional archeologists um, <laughs> in a, quite a big way. And um, basically, I, the, the knowledge about this site was about a line on the historic environment record. That was it. Um, and clearly, they excavated quite a big Roman villa. There's a car there, a scale. Um, so, yeah. But it's clearly a really signif significant site. Uh, the person who was writing up the site um, passed away in the late 2000s, early 2010s. I can't remember the exact year. Um, but there was one remaining member of the group who basically took it upon himself to write this whole site up. And he produced 450 pages with, with specialist reports as well, with people contributing. But... The site now actually has a report. Um, they weren't keen on getting it published in like a journal or anything like that um, because of the historic issues with, with the project. But we kind of wanted it to get it out there because this is a really significant site that no one has a clue about. So we kind of said, well, why don't we put it on Oasis? And we worked with Brian, who, who wrote it up, to get it onto Oasis. We took the archive. Um, they managed to get transfer of title in the two, like early 2000s, which was amazing for a community group. Because most time I talk to community groups, they have no concept of transfer of title. So it's really exciting. Um, but so we've worked with, uh, worked with them to get it onto Oasis. And um, so the report is now accessible. And we now store the archive. Um, it's not necessarily particularly um, well boxed or anything like that. But it is actually now usable as a resource. And we've had universities interested in actually using this collection. So there's sort of the four case studies I was going to talk about. Um, just a few concluding thoughts. Um, I mean, being open and building relationships is key. So all of these groups, one of the things, we're, we're new in the county. We've only been open since 2021. 20, um, lots of groups had this terrible fear that we were just going to come in and just take all of their archives and steal them from them, um, which is 100% not what we want to do. So a big part of what we've had to do is actually building those relationships and knowing that 
those groups knowing that they could just pick up the phone and talk to me through any of their ideas and being very open with them. Um, and a little help can go a long way. So it's so like that community group, the eyes group, where the, you know, we're just ha giving them hand-me-down material that we just don't need. Um, that has actually made a massive difference. It's clearly been playing on uh, the person who's been keeping it in their shed's mind for a very long time. And, you know, just three boxes has actually made a big difference and also improved the archive. Um, so yeah, again, you know, might have materials or facilities, you might have a room that's not always being used that actually a community group could use. Um, be pragmatic. I mean, this is, so we know that none of these archives we're gonna receive are perfect. Um, they're not, we're not expecting professional standards, but we ask for them to sort of look at the standards and see what can you get to. Um, I mean, we know that it's never gonna be perfect, um, but then some archives we get from units aren't perfect either. Um, so, and then you never know what opportunities. So that Soulgrave Castle project, you know, we didn't have any idea. We knew it was a significant site and then a university was interested in it and it potentially could be part of a major project. Likewise with Eastern Mordet. If we didn't have these archives, that opportunity wouldn't be there. And there are all sorts of funding opportunities and things that can come from that. And just a final one, we are very lucky in Northamptonshire for two sort of reasons. One, we have space, we, we have a, a new facility. But the other one is that we got to, we were doing this at this moment in time. If we'd been another five years down the line, some of these people would have passed away. The archives would have been lost. We got really lucky with the moment where we've done this. Um, we would have been luckier if it had been 10 years ago, but um, it is something that I think can't be underestimated actually how important it is that we got to it at this moment because most of the groups in the county have a sort of a very similar age demographic where in five, 10 years time, it's gonna be a problem. So, and I, that might be the case elsewhere in the country. Um, but yeah, that's sort of whistle-stop tour through community archeology span archives in Northants. Thank you. <laughs>